Let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, so grateful for this day, for the breath of life that we all have this morning. We praise your name and glorify you. We praise that we pray that all things we do today will be to glorify you. Thank you for all those that are here this morning, for their willingness to get out our busy schedules to, to study your word and to worship you. Pray that you'd be with all of us as we study this morning. And as we worship you, that we'll remind, be mindful of your son Jesus and his death on the cross and how much glory we should give to you and praise and honor. And uh, be with all the teachers downstairs. Thank you for the efforts that they've put into preparing for these classes and the students. Continue to bless this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One thing we forgot to do, Bill. You have to get the other. Oh, the remote. You have to get the oh. This one? No, no. Go 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 this one? Yeah, now stand, stand in. You have to go over here and get under it. You have to get under it. Modern nectology. What was our first plague? Blood of the Nile. And then the next three, who wants to do the next three? Quick, quick. Karen. gnats, but lice worked better. Um, so blood, frogs, lice, flies, and then Tom went over those last week. How many of those did the Israelites have to suffer in? Uh, first, three, first, three. first three, yeah. Um, so the blood, now do you th think the Israelites were able to drink water during that time? It says that the, it says that the Egyptians had to dig up water by, by the, the river Nile. You think the Egyptians, the Israelites also had to dig up water? Yeah, so that kind of implied. Um, frogs, they were suffered, Israelites suffered the plague of frogs, more than likely. And what do you think that is? Why do you think God made the Israelites go through that? No? Because he made it clear that not only did Pharaoh and the Egyptians need to see his power, but his own people need to see Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So that even his people would see it. And we see here, um, it was the blood was duplicated by the Egyptians. The frog was duplicated by the Egyptians. Um, and it says it even occurred in Goshen. And then the lice, um, not being able to be duplicate by the Egyptians, also occurred in Goshen where the Egyptians live. <coughs> um, so I think Bill's right in that it shows the power of God even to the Israelites. And then we get to the fires. <coughs> no more plagues will come along upon the Israelites. Um, so ideally they didn't have to deal with any of this, but we'll talk about that more. So now we get into our next one, which is the plague of the livestock. <laughs> the fifth plague, livestock disease, or you might call it pestilence. So, so blood, frogs, lice, flies, FLF, and then I got a, something for the next three. Who likes peanut butter and honey sandwiches? <laughs> peanut butter and honey, pestilence, boils, and hail. So fluff, PB, PBH. Maybe I'll help you remember them. <laughs> the Lord said, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle, in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep. A very severe pestilence, and the Lord will make a difference between Israel and Egypt. So specifically mentions which animals are going to be affected? The ones in the... 
field. And it kind of is similar to the bolt, to the hail because it said the same things. The ones that are left out are going to be are going to be hit. So and specifically mentions that there's a difference between Israel and Egypt. The Lord is not going to affect um, the cattle in Goshen in the fields. See, this is the same problem, Bill, with the formatting. Yeah. Uh, so animals in the field will be affected: horses, donkeys, camels, cows, sheep, and goats. Will not afflict the Israelite animals. The Lord, and and here, Deanna and I were talking about this this morning. The Lord specified when and how that this will take place. Basically, warned Pharaoh. Did Pharaoh heed? Did anyone heed? Hmm? The plague happened. How and when God said the Egyptian animals died. Now, what does that say about? us and our word to one another. Our word. The Bible says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Right? Um, should we give vows and promises as Christians? We're not supposed to. But we are supposed to let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. Our word should be our vow. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. And when God says something's going to happen... How and when it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Pharaoh sent men to see if the disease had afflicted the Israelites, and not one of the Israelites' animals died. So it's almost like Pharaoh was checking up on God, because God told him this is what's going to happen. It's not going to afflict the Israelites. So Pharaoh actually sent men to go check on that. And that should, to Pharaoh, say, wow, that's pretty powerful that he can afflict just our animals and not afflict the Israelite animals. You know, God, in, in different ways, shows his power. Um, and, and it's very similar to Jesus when he was going through all the different miracles. Like every time Jesus had a different miracle, it, it increased the apostles' faith because it was always something different, something new. Power over demons, power over life, power over water, blood. Um, so, similar with here, God continues to show his different power. So, it's not that he's able to afflict these diseases. Now, he can specifically decide who he wants to afflict these diseases upon. Who has their hand up, Joel? Uh, I don't think they're talking just historically. I mean, you know, my mind is trash, so I can't remember where, but. Some place in the New Testament it says these things written in earlier times were written for our instruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Romans 15 and 4. Romans 15. Right. How do you think this play negatively affected the Egyptians, having all their livestock in the field killed? How many different ways would it have affected their daily lives? Economically. Yeah. Sure. This wouldn't be the first time they were losing their lot of their livestock. They've already had to replace it a couple of times. Mm hmm Right. So it's expensive. Um plowing their fields, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's say labor. Labor? Yeah. I mean they were plowing fields, they were pull, pulling carts. I mean that's what the animals did. So it's really affecting their ability to, in their economy. And we're going to see even Pharaoh's people, his officials, have had enough. I mean, these, these plagues are destroying our country, basically what they told him. Kind of like what we all say now about our president. It's destroying our country. The Lord made Pharaoh continue to be proud and would not let the people go. This is the fifth plague. Pestilence. Our diseased livestock. Any comments, questions about this one? Nick? Combining everything that everybody said about how, how it was affecting people. So you got it was affecting the economy, it was affecting um, labor or workforce, it was affecting transportation or travel. Mm -hmm. It's basically the entire infrastructure of any kind of civilization. Animals would have been their infrastructure. It was kind of like if something happened to our trucking industry. Like we all kind of saw a couple years ago with the backlog because. Um, the ports in LA got clogged up. Trucks couldn't get in and out quick enough. So we saw that affect our economy. 
Also, too, the time frame that all this is happening, there's no time to recover. Everything's going back to back to back yeah. on a domino effect. Yeah, right. So, Mark, I think also, um, it, didn't, it doesn't say, but I would imagine in your mind, the Egyptian probably was questioning Pharaoh's authority in a sense of, this is happening to us because of his part being pardoned. They're figuring it out. Yeah. They're starting to blame him for having a stubborn heart. Yeah. So, back to our chart here. Um, the disease of cattle. We went over, I've talked about Hathor, um, probably the most prominent one of the Egyptian, Egyptian gods um, in, in regards to bulls and cows and cattle. Affected their property, death of their livestock. So it just affected them in a lot of different ways, the disease of the cattle. Um, but this next one um, might not destroy anything, but it's going to be very inconvenient. The boils. You can imagine, God's not, if God's going to afflict them, it's not going to be just one or two. It's not going to be a light affliction, is it? Anyone ever had a boil? And what is a boil? Ouch. <laughs> yeah. It's an infection, usually under the skin from the hair follicle. And it gets infected underneath, produces pus, itches, burns. You can't sit on them. You can't touch them. They're very painful. Then they burst. Yeah, basically what Andrew's been dealing with is, is basically starts as a boil. So, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Job had, had them, and Job was scraping them with with um, pottery just to get some relief so you can imagine how this how this felt and affected the and, and it would have been all the Egyptians I would imagine even Pharaoh couldn't even stand he couldn't even stand because it hurt so bad was on their feet then couldn't and we see that with his officials so the sixth plague is boils the Lord told Moses to take a handful of ashes from where they burn bricks I think this is symbolic. This is, this is how you're afflicting my people. So now I'm going to take that and I'm going to use it against you. Moses throws it in the air and then the wind just spreads it everywhere. And that creates the boils on the people. The ashes will blow like dust all over the land of Egypt and the dust will cause painful boils to appear. And I like how he did that right in front of Pharaoh. This is, this is the ashes from the brick, from the oppression that you've caused on Egypt. And it's going to cause boils. Now it's going to cause you oppression and affliction. And it, it's kind of neat. Again, he says, says to Moses, he says to them, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Yeah. And you got to remember when he says, You know where Pharaoh is going to be early in the morning. So Pharaoh is still doing what he does every day. Going down to the Nile to mm -hmm. you know, to intercede with, <coughs> with Pharaoh with God. So every day, early in the morning, Pharaoh goes down to the Nile. And so Moses, the, the Lord tells Moses, early in the morning, you know where Pharaoh is going to be. So go down to where Pharaoh is going to be. And do That's a really good point, because Moses doesn't have the knock on the door of the castle. You know, hey, I got something to say. No, Pharaoh's already outside. Doing his thing, worshiping his, with his God. So Moses just has to show up. So that's a, that's a real good point. Otherwise, I don't think he would let Moses in. The boils will afflict people and animals. It will even afflict the magicians, so they will not be able to stand, like, like you said. But Pharaoh was too proud and would not let the people go. What's the difference between God hardening his heart and he was too proud? I've seen the, con the difference. In the, sometimes in the wording. I think it's his free will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's his character. That's the kind of person that he is. He's a very man of great pride. And in Proverbs 16, the first, uh, the first thing that God missed is an abomination to him is a proud look. So, yeah, that's, that's why I listed this because I think it's real important. The fact that Maybe he looked down on the Egypt, on the Israelites and the fact that they were slaves, they were beneath him for that type of pride. 
And the pride comes, too, when you're king over everybody. There's that pride. When you're put in charge, sometimes that can go to your head. And there's that type of pride. So we should never look down on anybody. We should never elevate ourselves as well in any position that God has given to us because he's the one that's put us there. He's the one that's given us that position. In first five, um, first five plague, it was Pharaoh who hardened his heart. And then in this plague, it was God who hardened his heart. Mm -hmm. That's right. You see kind of that switch, mm -hmm. right? But in the other place, I think there are three talking about hardening. The middle one just says his heart was hardened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see kind of different wording throughout the different plagues, but all kind of all kind of meaning the same thing. But here it just talks about his pride, and and another one we'll see God actually increases his pride. So frogs like flies, um, PBH. We did the we did the peanut butter already. We did the um, the boils, and now the hail. Um, so the boils. The Egyptian god of healing, Serapis, Imhotep. That Hotep, that kind of sounds familiar. If you've ever watched a lot of movies, you, you hear that often, that Hotep. Yeah, so it's kind of ominous when I, when I hear that or read that. Um, but goddess of epidemics affects the physical bodies, and the <coughs> magicians in the end could not even appear in court, let alone duplicate it. So they're kind of taken out of the picture here mostly, aren't they? Yeah, there's no more of Pharaoh. Can, can my just magicians duplicate it? So the next one is uh, the hail. Why is it red? Why is there fire? Fire. Yeah, it said. That's what it said. Hail mixed with fire. Some versions say lightning, but some say lightning and fire. So imagine this. It's not just a hailstorm. Seventh plague. God told Moses, get up early in the morning and make Pharaoh listen to you. This is what Tom was just saying. <laughs> he just bugs them. Gets up early. Tell him, let my people go and worship me. If you refuse, I will send the entire force of my plague against you. I will punish you, your officials, all your people. Then you will know that there is nobody like me in the whole world. I could have killed you already. God is saying a lot to Pharaoh in this particular um, plague. Almost like God is getting fed up with Pharaoh. And here, he says, I'm going to send my entire force of my plagues on you. And we're gonna, you really see that in this one because of the fire, the thunder, the lightning. And that I mean, thunder and lightning indicates God's presence. Bill? Yeah, uh, it says there that uh, then you will know that there is nobody like me. It's fascinating because God used the prophet Isaiah <coughs> sent to his people who had turned away from him. And Isaiah 46, that's the exact same thing that God said, so that you will know that there's no one like you. Mm -hmm. So they had to do it to people with Pharaoh specifically. They also had to remind his own people about that. Yeah. I like what he says here to Pharaoh. I could have killed you already. I could have removed you and wiped you off the face of the earth. That would have been easy for me to do. But that wouldn't have served God's purpose, would it? But I let you live. Why? For this person, I purpose. I have raised you up. I have let you live. I have kept you in here. And that's what I was talking about earlier. When we have positions of authority, God places us those in, in those positions. God allows us to be in those positions. And that's at least how we need to view it. And so we shouldn't get a proud body over things like that because those are given to us by God. Even if you're super talented in an area, those are gifts from God. I was just talking about the other day my aunt. She can paint murals on them. She does for rich people. She paints murals on their walls and their homes and on their ceilings. That's what she does for a living. Like, I didn't get any of that. <laughs> I didn't get any talent. 
But yeah, God, God just blesses different people with different talents. Some have musical ability. Some can just play basketball real well. Let's look at Steph Curry and this girl, Caitlin Clark. Just broke all the records for college basketball men and women. She's just a shooter. She can shoot. God has blessed us all with different talents. Um, he says, but I let you live for the purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. Not just in Egypt, not just in Israel, but everywhere. For we know that when the Israelites eventually go to Jericho, when they eventually go to the land of Canaan, do the, the people in the land of Canaan know about God? Do they know these stories? Oh, yeah. So God, this is exactly right. The stories have gotten across the entire face of the earth. And so God was right when what he said here. Yeah, and uh, the spies went into uh, uh, Jericho, and they had told them the, the hearts of our people. Yeah, right? exactly right. You know, uh-huh. uh, it's not only that we heard about you, God, we're here. Yeah. And yeah. thank them. I'm just wondering what stories of great deliverance and power are they able to tell about their God? And what a crushing blow that should have been. How do you continue on this? Yeah. They've never seen anything like this. Other magicians have probably done things that made it look like it's their gods. No, they can't deliver them. That's the kind of point we made last week. Is they can't deliver them from any of this. They can maybe duplicate some of the stuff. Well, of all the things in the Bible, this is one of the stories that even people who don't know the Bible too well, they kind of know about the place. Yeah. They're not able to list them. You know, right. They, Most people know that story now, yeah. even if they're not too familiar with the Bible. Mm -hmm. They know the plagues of Egypt. Yeah, even with the death of Joseph, Joseph the Canaanites knew about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. God then warns Pharaoh about the upcoming hail. He tells him, this is very similar to the one we just did, where he, he told God, this is what I'm going to do when I'm going to do it. He tells him to bring the people and the animals in from the field. God tells him this. I'm going to bring this plague on you, but I'm also going to give you an opportunity not to be affected by it. Get indoors. That's all he's telling them. And that just tells me that people are stubborn. You've seen, you've seen six, six, six plagues so far that God has done. You don't believe that he can pr produce a seventh? It follows my mind. God then tells Pharaoh about the hail. He tells him when and, will it, when and where it will happen. He tells him to bring the people and the animals in from the field to take shelter, and any person or animal left out will be killed. There's never been a worse storm in the history, probably not of Egypt, but probably of the world. Uh, not too different from today. I mean, they saw all the other previous plagues, but they were probably thinking, well, it can't get any it worse. It can't be any worse than what we already saw. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are warned about hurricanes, when disasters that are happening. A lot of people just say, yeah, it's getting much worse. Have, have any men been killed up until now? With any of these? Mm hmm? Before now? Before now? Blood, frogs, lice, flies, pestilence, that was cattle. Boils, inconvenient. So really, probably no men have died. It's been inconvenient. But now, God's telling them, this is going to kill any person left outside. So I'm, I'm letting you know. So it's not on God if anyone dies. Yeah. Kind of goes back to his pride. Because God's warning him, God's telling him what he should do to avoid some of this, this wrath. And his pride says, I'm not going to listen to this, whoever, because in front of his people, that would demean him. And similar, whether it's husband, wife, or whatever, sometimes we're told of an idea that's a good idea, something we should probably heed, but I'm the man of the house, I would not be told. So stubbornness is basically pride. Yeah, yeah. God is telling him what to do to keep his people safe. 
just like in the Word, God tells us what to do so that we are saved, yeah. and we have that choice. Right. So we have a choice, and I I see a, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and people people say to the preacher, "Why would God make us just to send us to hell?" The whole point is you still have a choice. God has given you a way to get to heaven. If you accept Jesus, you get to heaven. If you d d deny Jesus, then that's your choice to go to heaven. So it's always a choice. Everyone among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring his servants and his livestock into the houses. But everyone who did not pay regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. So you had a lot of Egyptians now kind of on both sides. Um, the smart ones, the ones that would listen, and that, that's kind of like the word today, isn't it? We all know the, um, so it is today, we all know the parable of the sower. Very familiar with that. If you can spread the word, but some are going to fall on wayside where it's not even going to take root. Some are going to fall into the sto stones, and some are going to fall into the thorns, where they take root, but then they're choked out by the cares of the world. But then we know the good ground. And we see sometimes, um, you never know who that, who's going to um, have the honest heart and accept the word. So we can never judge somebody by what we know of them. Supposedly, Jeffrey Dahmer became a Christian before uh, he died. The worst of the worst. I mean, and Paul calls himself the worst of sinners, doesn't he? Saul at the time. Then Moses reached out with his staff, and the Lord sent, sent thunder, hail, fire, that darted to the ground, and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with hail, so, the, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt. It even says that the hail broke the trees. We had hail here fairly recently last year. Did you guys see it? Or it was early this year. And they were just little... Little tiny things, weren't they? But still, you didn't want to be caught out in it. And then I saw a video recently online of a guy driving on the highway, and you could see all the cars around him, and the hail literally breaking their windows. That was scary. The only place this did not hit was Goshen, so God saved Goshen. The Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron, and this is different for Moses, or, or for Pharaoh, where he actually says, I have sinned, which is interesting. I mean, that's a lot for someone to say that, isn't it? Um, maybe he's swallowing his pride a little bit. I don't know. Do you think he's playing Moses, telling Moses what he wants to hear? I think he could be in conflict with himself, because don't we? Don't we question ourselves and, oh, I'm, I know I've done this. And it may just play out in our brains, that's what happens to me. That we, you know, back and forth. I'm back and forth in my head all the time about different things, you know, whether it's sinful, right, good, bad, ugly, you know, it's just always. So it could be that he is finding some, some sincerity, but he's not. No, I think you're right. I think this is us in a nutshell. That when we're desperate, we, we seek God and we plead for God. And just things get comfortable again. We go back into the world and we forget God. And that's all of us in our lives. We just that's our that's our pattern. And I think that's Pharaoh's pattern. Um, I and my people have done wrong. <clears throat> Pray to the Lord on our behalf. We have done <laughs> we have had enough thunder and hail. And I will let you go. Thunder scary. Been woken up in the middle of the night by that? Loud. So when you see that lightning, you know what's coming. And you can tell how far away it is. But sometimes that thunder is just a crash. <coughs> loud. Lamar? Um, you know, we were talking about people in our Wednesday class. Um, they try to compare with Moses and Aaron, the Egyptian magicians. But Pharaoh never went to his magicians and said to remove these things. No, or duplicate them. So Moses said to him, As soon as I go out of the city, I will spread my hand out to the Lord, and the thunder will cease, and there will be no longer be hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. 
But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not fear the Lord God. So Moses maybe kind of knew Pharaoh was just playing a game. And uh, he was just saying what Moses wanted to hear. Question, how did Moses get out of the city unscathed? <clears throat> Still hailing. He says, I'm going to raise my hands when I get out of the city. Well, Moses had to walk through it, didn't he? <laughs> you think there was an umbrella over God? <laughs> 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 Yeah. So Moses can walk through this and uh, without getting any hail on him. I think that hail looked like. How big do you think that was? But the problem was here, not only did it affect man and beast, but their, their crops. So the crops that were budded, the crops that it already had produced, were destroyed. But the wheat and the spelt that, were, that had not ripened yet were saved. For now until something else gets to him. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had stopped, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So he did not let the sons of Israel go. That's kind of a crazy storm. That's a current. That's a hail storm. Um, so it came out on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet sounds with all the people who were in the camp trembled. Remember when the Israelites were scared when Moses was on the mountain because there was thunder and lightning? It usually represents God. God is present. And so to me, the hail was the first one that just showed God's power to the people of Israel, um, Egypt. Um, and do you think the Israelites were able to see this and hear this? Of course, they were right there. Probably the hail didn't affect them, but they were able to see it and hear it. This is some modern day hail. Those are, those are baseball size. This is the video, like the video I saw, just crushing through it. So if, if the Israelite, if the Egyptian plague was worse than this, imagine hail bigger than that. Because the intent was to kill. Not to hurt, not to damage, but to kill. So I can imagine they were, um, and to break tree limbs, they would have had to have been big. So at least grapefruit size and bigger. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have insurance for hail damage, right? But this, yeah, I've never been in hail like that. So blood, frog lice, flies, um, PBH, hail. Um, Isis and Seth, we all are familiar with those Egyptian gods. Isis and Seth. Um, speaking of Seth, where is Seth? He didn't come, huh? <laughs> it's good to see you, Danielle. Um, so the historical uniqueness of this storm, Pharaoh confesses his sins, but later changes his mind. So some interesting facts here. All right, the next one, eighth plague of locusts. And that's probably what it looked like. You know, when locusts came over, and this was something that they'd probably seen before, when locusts would come over, it would literally blacken the skies. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh. I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, so that I may perform these signs among them, that you may tell in the presence of your son and of your grandson how I made mockery of the Egyptians, how I performed my signs among them, so that you may know that I am the Lord. So now the Lord is telling Moses, I'm, I've done these things for you, for you to tell your kids and for them to tell their kids for these stories to be passed on. And they, like, like you said, they have been passed on. Most everybody on the planet just knows the story of the ten plagues, whether they believe it or not. We know these stories, and they show God's power. So it, they've done exactly what God has expected it to do. And he expects, he expects them to tell the stories. We know when Joshua went into the land, it says there arose up a generation that did not know God, because what did they stop doing? Stop telling these stories. 
That's why I really appreciate Dwayne Gandy. You guys all know Dwayne Gandy? Yeah, his, that's his kind of his thing is, is the stories. Tell the stories. Joel? They, they remember starting with Red Sea after 400 years. I don't know how long this was before uh, they were fighting the Philistines, but the Philistines remembered um, in 1 Samuel 4 and verse 8, it said, they, they said, Help, who can save us from the mighty gods of Israel? They're the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians. Uh, if you don't, if you don't, we will become uh, the Hebrew slaves just as they have been ours. Mm -hmm. So the Philistines remember. Good point. The Lord said to Pharaoh, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before? There's that pride again. Let my people go, they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They will cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has survived. We talked about in the last plague. Um, what is left to you from the hail? And they will eat every tree which grows in the field. Then houses will be filled with them, with the houses of all your servants and the houses of the Egyptians, not the Israelites. Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? So this is when you really start to see now his own people are bugging him. They're telling him, Let the people go. Let them go. How long are you going to allow this to happen? Don't you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? We see it financially. We see the landscapes change. The stench. I mean, it's just being destroyed. It's not the same country that they had before. God's going to leave it in shambles, and he's going to leave them broke without an army. Pharaoh said to Moses, um, go and not God. Go serve the Lord your God. And then he says, well, who are you going to take with you? You know, it's like a little caveat here. So go serve the Lord your God. I'm tired of this. Well, who are you going to take? And Moses said, we shall take our young and our old with our sons and our daughters. We shall take our flocks and our birds. For we must hold a feast to the Lord. He says, everybody's leaving. Come. I think it's really in, important to note here that after his Pharaoh's advisors say, hey, you know, you really got to do something because Egypt is destroyed them, that they brought Moses and Aaron back yeah. after they had, you know, you know, talked to Pharaoh first and they left, Moses and Aaron left. And then his advisors say, you know, you really got to do something. Mm -hmm. They brought him back. Brought him back, yeah. And then they're talking to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, you know, Pharaoh's talking to him, and then Pharaoh's talking to him, and Pharaoh says, well, how's this going to work? Mm -hmm. And then that's when you see that God is heart, Pharaoh's heart, right there, because he's starting to say, well, how's this going to work? Yeah. So Pharaoh says, so may the Lord be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Watch out. He is on your mind. So Pharaoh is basically saying, no, um, you can take the men, but I'm not going to let you take anyone else. For, all, for now, only the men can go. Uh, because it, in his mind, if he left the women and the children behind, what are the men going to do? They're going to come back. So in his mind, if he, if, if he can at least satisfy that part, but Moses said, no, we've all got to go or no one. So, and the locusts um, settled in all of Egypt. Um, do you think the locusts were in the land of Goshen? No. They were carried by east wind all day and night, and in the morning in the east wind. Did it specifically say they weren't affected? Didn't say. This one doesn't say. So it's possible that the locusts affected Goshen, but we, we don't know. And what would have been the negative of it? They would have lost their crops. They would have lost their trees. But who cares? God's in God's mind, what? They're leaving. And then why would they, if, if all their crops were good and their trees were good, what would Pharaoh do when the, Egypt, the Israelites left? He would go raid theirs, and he would have food, and he would have plenty. So maybe it was in God's plan to destroy it all. So to cover the surface of the sky... They ate every plant, every green thing. Um, 
And then Pharaoh says, please forgive my sin again and plead with the Lord. And as just as an east wind carried him in, a west wind carried him out. And I love this, not one was left. That's a miracle in and of itself. There wasn't even one locust when God got rid of them. So let's keep moving on here. Um, so now the locust, now the darkness. Um, in the locust, Pharaoh offers a compromise. The compromise is rejected. Pharaoh again confesses his sin. And this, for my reading, Senehem was and Serapia were the two Egyptian uh, kings that, or gods that this was against. Now darkness, uh, Re or who? Ra. Okay, might be another name for them. Amun Re or Amun Ra, um, Otum. Oh, these are other names that were kind of mixed with um, Ra. So when you're play, when you're thinking of darkness, this is what you've got to think. Because if God gets rid of the light, when there's no light, it's pitch dark. And I don't think God, I think God will have blocked out the sun, and God will have blocked out the moon. And there's a depiction of Ra, always with a falcon head, with a sun disc over his head. Another depiction of Ra. Arguably the most important god to the Egyptians. Ra is the sun god and is one of the oldest deities in ancient Egypt. He was later merged with others such as Horus, the morning sun, so Horus Ra, Amun Ra, the noonday sun, and Autumn Ra, evening sun. So he morphed into multiple gods. He embodied the power of the sun, was also considered to be the sun. Envisions this as a great god riding his barge across the heavens throughout the day and descending into the underworld at night in his barge. Ra was already established by the time of the Old Kingdom. Remember the, the uh, ancient pyramids of Giza? And continued uh, until, like all other Egyptian gods, was eclipsed by Christianity. The pyramids of Giza are, are associated with Ra as the supreme lord and creator of God. So notice that creation is even mentioned with Ra, who ruled over the land and of the living and of the dead. So arguably, they're most important and head deity. Then the Moses, Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand, and he didn't warn him on this one, did he? Reach out your hand towards the sky so there'll be darkness over the land, darkness which may be felt. I think that means pitch black, that there's no light. Why else would they be frozen in their homes? He did not warn him about this plague, just like he didn't warn him about the gnats and the boils. There was darkness for three days. They did not even see one another. Yet you know, when you're in a dark room in a dark cave, there's no light, you don't want to move. The other day I went into my office at work and there's no windows. And if the doors are all shut, I can't see my hand in front of my face. I'm trying to find the, the switch and I ended up in my closet. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is not right. <laughs> but that's what happens when you can't see. You don't know where you're at. You don't want to go anywhere. They didn't go anywhere for three days. Israelites had light in their dwellings. Do you think this affected Israelites' surroundings but not the, their homes? Thought about that. That Perhaps because God blotted, blotted out the light from the sky, that it was dark, but they were able to have light in their homes. That's kind of the impression I got. Pharaoh sent for Moses, he said that the Israelites can go, but they cannot take their animals. So before, you can only take your men, and Moses said, no, i got to take them all. And now he says, okay, you can take, you can go with your women and your children and your men, but you can't take animals. And Moses is like, well, that's what we use for gifts. That's what we sacrifice with. Moses said they needed the animals to give us gifts. They cannot leave one animal. And then Pharaoh gets mad. Lord far hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Get away from me, he says. So now Pharaoh's mad. Be careful, do not see my face again, for when you do, you shall die. So now Pharaoh's just done with Moses. Moses is not willing to bargain. Of course, there's no bargaining when you hold all the chips, is there? Moses holds all the cards, you might say. There's no bargaining here. Of course, Pharaoh wanted to bargain. But he's not going to get his way because God's in charge. God's going to get his way. Moses said, you have spoken correctly. I shall never see your face again. Wow. How powerful is that? 
You have said it right, Pharaoh. We're, we're not going to see each other again. Darkness. Thank you, everyone. Teacher training class, it's the same as what you guys would do. The class starts at 2, but everybody's welcome for lunch. It's going to be on song leading, so even if you're not leading songs, 
It's still good for the men to come just to participate. Um, Randy would like to know if any young men would do read scripture. So if any are interested, please see me. Just for just a scripture reading. The men come to the back, please.
Welcome to everyone. Welcome to all of our members and a special welcome to all our visitors, all our guests. We are so happy that you're here today. Thank you so much for coming here to worship, worship God today. This is the Lord's day that we are here to worship him. Thank you so much for being here. Let's take this time, everyone, to make sure that your cell phones and electronic devices are on silent so that we can have a worship time that uh, doesn't have any interruptions. Just uh, just have a few moments where we have some announcements and then we can continue our worship to God. Um, uh, there's a, uh, let's remember all those who are in need of our prayers, all those who are sick, those who are traveling. Let's remember all those who are in need of our prayers. Uh, Sony's father is starting a Bible school in India, and she has requested that we uh, remember him in our prayer. So let's remember Sony's father in India as he is starting a Bible school in India. There is a, uh, <clears throat> a teacher's training class today at the Pratt's house at 2 p.m. So for those who are uh, going to have that class at 2 p.m. Uh, Mario's parents are traveling back from, from Mexico today. Remember them in your prayers. The Portage singing is this Friday. Uh, so uh, uh, you can, if you want to go to that. And uh, they are requesting uh, or, or needing young men for, for scripture reading. And if any young men here want to do that, see Brother Dale uh, if you want to do that. We also are going to have a men's training class uh, next Sunday afternoon. Uh, and it's going to be uh, on the subject of uh, singing in the assembly. So remember, uh, all the men can uh, come to that for uh, our men's training class. And a special announcement uh, for the whole congregation, we have uh, a lot of clutter on our coat rack in the back. We have pots and pans, we have old uh, coats that have been there for maybe a year or so, and just a lot of junk. So, this is the notice. That stuff is going to be gotten rid of. 
And the deacons are going to get rid of it this week. This is your final notice. If you want any of that stuff, get rid, take it today because it's going to be gotten rid of this week. It's going to be gone. Um, there is uh, gospel meetings that are in the area. Well, some of them are in the area. Some of them are downstate. Uh, Lockport uh, Church of Christ is having a gospel meeting in, in April 28th through May 2nd. And Pontiac Church is having a meeting May 5th through the 10th. So there's, and there's other gospel meetings in the area. Uh, so uh, there's maybe some on the bulletin board. So we'll put these notices up on the bulletin board as well. For our worship today, Brother Dale has our uh, songs. Brother Lamarck has our opening prayer. Uh, Brother Ben has our scripture reading. Brother Joel has our closing prayer. Brother Tim has the, uh, is leading on the Lord's uh, table. Uh, and serving are Brother Vince, Brother Tom Schmidt, uh, Brother David Washington, and Brother Xander. And uh, now we'll turn it back over to Brother Dale. Our next hymn will be Abide With Me. After this hymn, we'll have our opening prayer and the collection to follow. Abide with me fast, falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me
Father, we are so grateful for today, the Lord's Day, your day, Father, that we may come and worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you, as the song said, for being friends of sinners, and that's us, Father. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your Son, Christ, who has redeemed us from death itself, who has given, given us the hope of life, eternity, Father. And we know that we've been given the message to continue to spread your will because of the death of your son, Christ. We're not here really to celebrate his death, but his resurrection, our hope, our calling for eternity, Father. We know we're sojourners in this world and we're just passing through. Help us to remember that just like our brothers and sisters of the old times, of the Testament of the old, that we had prophets and we had priests and we had kings and they proclaim the coming of the Messiah, your anointed one, our Messiah, our Holy One, our Redeemer. And uh, Father, help us to remember our message, our proclamation, our confession, the day that we said that Jesus is Lord. And upon that faith that we took the plunge into baptism and to help us to remain faithful until the day that you return and that we hold these words in our hearts but not just to ourselves, Father. We know we have been given the great commissions like the brothers of the New Testament, that we may be faithful until the day that you've called us home and that we may hear these great words, well done, good and faithful servant, Father. Help us to remain true to you and to the call that we've answered. Thank you for this time now. Be with us as we continue our service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I've always been told, why you smile so much? Because I like to bring joy to others. And that we're supposed to be, we're Christians, right? We're supposed to be happy that we're a part of Jesus Christ, we wear his name, Christian. Yeah. I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I'm going to go a little sideways this morning, but I'm going to bring it back together. For the past couple of months, weeks, and days, we know what's going on in this church. And as I went down to Indianapolis this weekend, I saw a couple of kids. I was proud to wear their shirts. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. God works in mysterious ways, don't he? Because as I did the men's devotion, the title said Mission Impossible. That's what the world outside them doors wants us to think that our mission to be Christians is impossible. I'm gonna read a scripture, which is one of my favorites. <coughs> one of Bill's too. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. You thank God as you woke up this morning? Some might think this morning, brother, you don't know what I'm going through. I'm gonna lay off, I lost my job. I got cancer, marital problems. My kids not listening to me. I'm stressed out, or even the biggest one. My kids are old enough of age, they are not Christians yet. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you right now, go to God in prayer for all. I thought about what I was gonna say for the past couple of weeks, I knew I was gonna have this day. Talk about the offering. So, I usually have a word, but today is mission impossible. To God be the glory, he makes a way out of no way. But sometimes we think the mission is impossible in this walk of life. Nobody said this life would be easy, especially for Christians. Well, that's what the devil wants us to think anyway, right? When our flesh gets weak and not trusting God when times get rough. Instead, we want to do things in our own way and not trust God and get in the way. But we're supposed to leave all our worries to him. So I'm going to pause right there before I finish reading. Look around you. My sister in the back, Selena. Praise God, she beat cancer. 
I might get a little emotional, but it's okay. My wife and my brother. Lost their jobs. But praise God, so many phone calls us came and said, you have a job right here for you. Did you hear what I just said? When one door closed, four or five opens. Do not fear about what outside them doors do. We have an awesome God. And I don't care that I'm crying right now. Because we're supposed to be joy. It's joy crying right now. When we lose our job or a layoff, or any of us going through something, please believe. Stop and pray to God. Thank Him. So many times, instead of letting God lead you, we want to hold Him behind and say, I got this, God. No, you don't. Step back and let God lead you. Mission impossible. <laughs> to go along with that, I'm going to read one of my scriptures, Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask that it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock at the door. It should be given to you. I ask you, brothers and sisters, do not be like Peter. When times get rough, don't take your eye out the gold. Don't be like Peter and start sinking. Keep your eye focused on God. I didn't want to get emotional this morning. I really didn't. But I asked you on your way here, how your mindset was. Was your mindset to come to these doors and praise God? Or are you focused on your worries and cares of this world? I'm going to give you a better example. Same thing Jesus did, we should do also right now. When Jesus is on that mountaintop, what do you tell Satan? Get behind me, Satan. It's the first thing we're supposed to do when we have problems. Not go to somebody at work, not to go to a family member and spread and talk about your business because the first thing they're going to do is get on the phone and spread your gossip anyway. Let's put all our cares in his hands. Do we feel defeated at times? Yes, we do, but please get on your knees and pray to our awesome God. So I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. Bear with me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Isaiah 54, 17. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. Cast your cares on God. Cast your cares on the Lord. And he will sustain you. Psalms 55, 22. Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not worry, but tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. <laughs> Amen. But itself, each day has its own trouble of its own. So I'm going to read a couple other scriptures that I had. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. But trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your own understanding. Like I said earlier, do not lean on your own understanding. Go to God. Let God lead us and not try to lead God. Take control. That God, I got this. No, you don't. In all your ways, submit to him. Submit to him. And he will make your path straight.
John 15, 4 through 7. Remain in me, also I remain in you. Did you hear that? Remain in me, I remain in you. So why are we stressing? Anxiety, worry, hypertension. The Bible says, fear nothing but him. The devil put that all in us. What are we doing? I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away. And withers, such branches are picked up. Thrown into the fire and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Praise God. Amen. In the first quarter, I used that with my teenagers. And I told Xander, who's my battling buddy, anybody who teaches knows this. I said, write that scripture down. I'm going to let you guys know on a Wednesday when I'm going to do it. Sorry, guys, I did it on a Sunday. And don't lag because I got a droid. I know y'all Apple phone people in here. See this charger? See this phone? More kids than parents, but mostly these days parents. What do we do when this phone goes dead? We're scrambling. Trying to charge his phone in the car, house, or even in the building. All doing while I was in Nathan's competition, I saw everybody on their phone charging the only phone. Why does Red and Chop and John right now? So, what are we supposed to do with this phone and this charger? Every day, this word charges us. If we don't have this word, what do we do? We walk away and think we got it all handled under control. But when that life gets hard, what do we do? We need to charge. So I ask you today, don't let this world affect you, because we know, as my wife used to say, you're here, but you're not here. It took me a while. So I'm going to ask you today, are you here or you're not here? And our giving, we know this world affects us and giving God the praise, the glory that he deserves, and our giving. So I'm going to ask you right now as we go to God in prayer that you give your first fruits and your best. Let's bow. Thank you, Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you so much. For we know we can count on you, hey, Father. Let us not be like Peter. Take our eyes off of you in this Christian walk that we have with you in this life. That we can count on you, trust in you, have more precious faith in you, and not count on people around us. But we know we can count on our brothers and sisters here. Because we know when two or three are gathered, you are here in our presence. And more and more of us, as we pray together, we have more prayers answered and called. We pray also, Heavenly Father, we go through this time right now as we get ready to give, that we give freely from our hearts, not our last. Pray also, Heavenly Father, as we, we know that you are unseen, but your presence is so evident and close. We express gratitude that your workings are already underway within us, and our family here can think and depend on you. We voice our needs. We are thankful that your hands are stretched out and ready to guide us, to hold our hands and lead us even before. We realize it, Annie Father. Please touch our hearts to grab your hand, that we let you lead us in our ways of thinking and giving. Please accompany us and stir out our hearts at the appropriate times so that we are not caught off guard by the trials we encounter but always be prepared to remain vigilant and prayerful, confident that we are not abandoned amidst life's struggles. And in Jesus' name I pray. The church say amen. Amen.
selected two hymns to now prepare our minds for partaking of the Lord's Supper. First hymn is, He Carried My Sorrows. <coughs> he carried my sorrows, he bore my griefs, was pierced for transgressions, afflicted for peace. He knew by his stripes I am healed, through his blood I can heal, for by his oppression I worship my King. He suffered in
If you would please turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 18. At this time in our service, we are uh, preparing to partake of the Lord's Supper to remember Christ's death on the cross for us and the salvation that we have through his death and through his resurrection. We're going to be considering a prophecy from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, prophecy that would ultimately, of course, be fulfilled in Christ. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy, we had, uh, Moses is uh, speaking to the people towards the end of his life, giving the law uh, to them, repeating the law to them, but also uh, preaching to them and encouraging them to serve the Lord. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse uh, 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see his great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So Moses speaks of uh, that God is going to raise up another prophet that is going to come that would be like him, that would be like Moses. He would come from among them, be one of their brothers, and that they would listen to him, that it would be important that they listen to him. And he goes back uh, to the event of, at, on Mount Sinai. When God's presence was so uh, great and uh, fear, fearful in the fire and the smoke and, and uh, the thunder on the mountains that the people were scared. And the people said, uh, said we, don't want to, we don't want God to speak to us anymore, else we're going to die. And God said, they're right. They need a prophet. And so from then on, it was Moses who spoke directly to, went up on the mountain to speak directly uh, to God for them. And so... Uh, God is saying there's going to be a come to another prophet. Even after Moses, there'll become another prophet who will go before the people and uh, before God on behalf of the people. And it says some, some important things in verse uh, 18. That he says, I will put my words. In other words, God will put his words in the prophet's mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So the prophet's words would come uh, from the father himself, and so people would, not, would need to listen, because if they didn't listen to the words of the prophet, they weren't listening to the father, and therefore God would require it of them. So as mentioned, we know then, of course, that that prophet, the prophet like Moses, would be Jesus. When we turn to the uh, New Testament in the book of John, chapter 5, Jesus himself referred uh, to this. In John chapter 5, uh, and read verses 45 through 47, Jesus here is speaking uh, to the people, uh, speaking of the, he's been speaking of the witnesses to himself, to his own authority, to who he is, and he says in John 5, 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you did not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And so Jesus speaks of Moses, and he says that Moses wrote about him, that Moses wrote about Jesus. And of course, uh, not, uh, Moses' writings don't directly speak of, of Jesus or the name of Jesus, and yet he was saying he was writing about him, and of course, uh, clearly referring to the prophet, that the prophet that would come, as well as, as other places. But notice he's talking about, he's saying that Moses accuses them because they had set their hope on Moses. This prophecy of a prophet to come like Moses was well known among the Jews. We know that because it's spoken of of a number of places uh, by the Jews, uh, spoken of by Peter when he's preaching to the Jews. Um, th th this was a well-known prophet in the uh, after Moses, the, the Israelites and the Jews, they were looking for that prophet. They were waiting for that prophet to come like Moses. And, um, um, and Jesus is saying, he spoke about me. But at the same time, accusing them because just like they didn't believe Moses, they didn't believe him. Immediately after that, in chapter 6, we have Jesus, the miracle where Jesus feeds the 5,000 people. 
And at the end of that miracle, in uh, chapter, John chapter 6, verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And so some did believe. When they saw the sign, when they saw the miracles that Jesus did, just like Moses had performed many miracles, Jesus, uh, there were some who believed and realized this is the prophet. This is the one we've been looking for. This is the one that we've been waiting for. And if we think about Moses, we think about his life, and compare there are many ways in which Jesus was like Moses. Uh, beginning from, uh, from his birth as a baby, uh, of course, Moses was saved from the decree of the king that he, uh, that, uh, sh- that he should have died as a baby. And similarly, of course, Jesus also was saved from the decree of the king to uh, kill the babies. Um, like uh, Moses, Jesus was called out of Egypt uh, after his parents had to flee to Egypt. Matthew 2, verse 15, uh, refers to the prophecy that he would be called out of Egypt. Um, Light, uh, as uh, Moses then spent 40 years in the wilderness before being uh, called by God uh, to lead his people, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness uh, to begin his ministry. And we can think of many, and, we, and uh, I won't list them all, but as we go through the life of Moses in our class on Exodus, we can think about and see those ways that uh, Moses was like Jesus. But an important way that's called out specifically in the prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18 is Moses will have a very, very special relationship with God. Moses will have the relationship to God where, uh, where he is the one who, who speaks directly to God on behalf of the people. He is able to intercede on behalf of the people. He is able to go and talk directly to God. In Numbers chapter 12, uh, later on we have this story as uh, Moses is leading the people and the people uh, frequently... Uh, don't listen to Moses, they, uh, they rebel against him, they criticize him, and this is one of those times, and God specifically in Numbers chapter 12 uh, defends Moses, and he says in uh, Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, and he said, hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make, uh, m- make myself known to him in a vision, I speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles, and he beholds the the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So God speaks of this special relationship he has with Moses, that they speak directly to each other, mouth to mouth, that God appears, that God uh, showed himself uh, to Moses in a very special way, and so he had that special relationship. And of course, that is certainly true of Jesus as well, that he had that close relationship with God, with the Father. They, uh, from the very beginning, uh, Jesus, from the age of 12, said, I must be about my father's business. And he knew that he had that, needed to have that relationship with him. And he was consistently speaking to the father, praying to the father. In John chapter 5, as we read the end of the chapter there earlier, where Jesus refers to the prophecy of Moses, earlier in that, as he's talking to the people, earlier in that uh, chapter, He's talking about the fact that he does the will of the Father, that he was there to do the will of the Father. He spoke the words of the Father, and he would say that frequently, that I'm not speaking my own words. The words that I speak are the words of the Father. He says in John chapter 5 and verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Again, he's saying the words that I speak are the words that are bring eternal life. They are the words of the Father uh, himself. In verses 37 and 38, uh, he says, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. So you see, again, this idea, they hadn't seen the Father. They didn't know the Father. They hadn't seen the Father, but they didn't believe because they didn't know the Son. They didn't listen to the Son, the one whom uh, God had sent. And so that brings us to another way in which Moses is like Jesus, and that is despite the fact that they both had the directly the words of the Father, frequently the people did not listen. Uh, and that was certainly the case uh, with, with Moses, that time and again, the words that he spoke, even though they were the words of the Father, were rejected by the people. In Acts chapter 7, in Stephen's sermon to the people, in Acts chapter 7, he uh, picks up on this point about Moses. 
Uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 35. This Moses, whom they rejected, that is the Israelites, this Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the, and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt. So you see again, uh, Stephen mentions about Moses and about this prophecy. This, Moses is the one who said, there will come a prophet from me, and yet Moses himself was continually rejected by the people. Uh, this God, even though God sent him to be a ruler, God sent him to be a redeemer, and yet he was frequently, he was consistently rejected by those people. And so that brings us then to the final and the most important way in which Jesus was like Moses, and that is that he was a redeemer. He was, he brought salvation to the people. Moses was the one that God sent to bring the people out of oppression, out of slavery, of, slavery in Egypt, and uh, to bring them salvation from their slavery. And so in the same way, Jesus is the prophet like Moses, that he is the Redeemer. He is the one who brings salvation. He is the one who brings us out of the slavery, the oppression of sin that we uh, could not escape without him bringing that uh, salvation to us. And so at this time, as we do every Sunday, we gather to remember, to celebrate that salvation that came from Jesus, that came from him as our Redeemer, that came from him being the prophet like Moses. And just like the people of Israel we could not stand in God's presence either. Just like the people, when we read the story of the people who said, Moses, you go talk to the people, otherwise we're going to die. That's us. We couldn't stand in God's presence due to our sin or we would die. We needed a prophet to go between, to go between us and God, to be the redeemer, to bring salvation. And that redeemer is Christ. In Acts chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, here we have uh, Peter speaking again to the, people of, uh, to the people of Israel. He says in Acts 3, verse 18, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed, uh, appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from, from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And so Peter makes clear beyond a doubt that the prophet like uh, Moses was Jesus himself, that this was what was foretold by all the prophets, that the, uh, that the Christ would come and that he would suffer so that uh, he could bring salvation to us. So let's think about these things. Let's keep these things in mind as we uh, prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, thinking about Christ, thinking about the salvation, thinking about the standing that we could not have before Christ if it weren't for uh, before God, the standing we cannot have before God if it were not for Christ, and the salvation that he brought to us. At this time, I'll ask the men to come forward. We'll partake of the uh, bread, remembering his uh, death, the, sac the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross, remembering uh, his uh, body in the bread. Let us pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you that you have uh, a great plan to save us from our sins, that we could be with you, that we could uh, stand uh, before you, Despite, uh, despite our sins, that you have uh, the given us the opportunity to be forgiven through your son. We're so grateful at this time for uh, his death, his sacrifice that uh, showed us your grace and mercy and allowed us uh, to be forgiven of our sins. We pray that we will have uh, the right heart and the right mind at this time to uh, remember that and remember how important it is in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
The men will come forward. We also at this time will partake of the fruit of the vine, which is Christ's blood that was shed for us uh, in his sacrifice on the cross. It is that uh, blood which uh, gives us the forgiveness of our sins. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we continue in thanksgiving to you and praise uh, to you and to your Son and uh, being so grateful, Lord, for his sacrifice, for his blood that was uh, shed for us, that uh, allows us to be forgiven. And we're, uh, our hearts are, are full of thanks to you for that, and we uh, pray that you will be with us again at this time as we uh, continue to remember uh, his blood that was shed for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
time we'll continue with our song service. If you would please stand for this song, remain standing for the scripture reading. <laughs> We just talked about the Egyptians were in darkness for three days. And some symbolism there in this song actually gives some of that symbolism that God's word is a light unto our feet. If we are not Christians, if we don't have Christ, then we are in darkness when we're in sin. And we need that lamp, we need that light to guide our way, and that's what God's word does for us. So this song is thy word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. After this song, we'll have our scripture reading. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there in the Negev, then go on into the hill country and see what the land is like, and whether the people who live in are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and, I'll, I'll, and how in the land in which they live. Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fort fortifications? And how is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So, when, so they went up and spied on the land from the wilderness of Zen as far as Rehab and uh, the bone map. Please be seated. Obviously, you forgot that I have a policy that nobody cries alone. So I teared up while you were you were here. But I I, I think that as we're supposed to do, and that is to feel 
to experience with our brothers and sisters in Christ what they're going through, what they are dealing with. How else are we going to be able to help them uh, properly if uh, we don't actually have the ability to understand, to feel what they're going through? So uh, I very much appreciated what you had to say, Vince. You know, what was the account that um, Brother Ben just uh, read about, I think is very familiar to pretty much all of us Bible students. Uh, and that is the account of Moses sending the 12 sp uh, spies into the land of Canaan. And it would be fine if it ended with what Brother Ben read just a moment ago, but it doesn't, does it? As we continue on reading, it says that when they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at, at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told him and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. That sounds all really good, doesn't it? But then there's this nevertheless. The people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and every large uh, and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it. For we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people. They are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land of, uh, that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and uh, are part of the, uh, the Nephilim. And we became grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Grasshoppers in our own sight. We saw ourselves as Nothing more than grasshoppers. And if you paid close attention to while I was reading that, you, will, you can see why they saw themselves as grasshoppers. The word we appears seven times as they give their account in regard to their experience of going into the land of Canaan. Not once did they refer to God. Not one single time. You, you remember in the New Testament the man who had this a great abundance of crops. And he said, what shall I do? I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger barns. And all the six times he said the word, the pronoun I, referring to himself and not once did he mention God. It's a problem, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Isn't it a big problem? Something that, uh, that Brother Vince mentioned even when he was giving his uh, speech before we had the uh, partaking, uh, taking up of the collection. That one of the things that is a struggle for all of us, and that is that far too many times we leave God completely out of the picture. As Brother Vince pointed out, we step back, and rather than letting God step forward and taking care of the situation, we step back, we tell God all about it, but then we step back up here. Either that or we don't step back at all. And we face life upon this earth that is just way too hard without God. Let me say that again for any who are here and don't have God as your God and Jesus as your Savior. Life here upon this earth is way too hard without God. As a matter of fact, Vince, that is mission impossible, isn't it? Jesus himself said it when they said, who then can be said? The 12 apostles asked him, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with men it's impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. And ladies and gentlemen, the most impossible thing 
that mankind has ever known is to be saved without Jesus Christ. That's the most impossible thing. I know that we have uh, uh, NASA and various people talking about going to Mars and all that kind of stuff. And I believe that even if they make that journey over there, what are they going to do with it? But I think that that's impossible. I think it's impossible for us to go to some of the other planets in our solar system and, uh, and that sort of thing. But those things pale in comparison to how impossible it is for us to be right in the sight of God and live in hope of living forever that which all mankind wants. And that is to live forever. And so in this situation here, there were 12 men that were sent in there to spy out the land. And they came back and all 12 of them agreed, man, it's great over there. I mean, as far as the, the fruit, as far as it being beautiful, it was indeed just as God himself described to us, uh, that it's a land flowing with milk and honey. But then of those 12 that went over there, all of them had seen the power and the, 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 the miracles that God had performed in Egypt. We finished just today. We just finished those. those. Oh, Tom, uh, uh, Dale, you, you left the, the, the best one for Tom. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes. But these 12 men had seen what took place in Egypt. They all had seen the parting of the Red Sea. They had all, every single one of them, seen God provide water and food for them in a place where there was no water or food. They had seen all those things. They saw themselves, uh, for themselves, the land was, that was, it was exactly as God had described it. And yet 10 of those 12 men left God completely out of their report. All they thought about and all they talked about was the nevertheless stuff. It was indeed a land flowing with milk and honey, nevertheless. That's kind of like that word, but, you know, it negates everything that went before it. You say and describe something that is absolutely beautiful and wonderful and so forth, and then you say, but, and then you have a few more things to say, and whomever it is that you're talking with, they don't remember any of the stuff before the word but. It's the stuff that came after the word but. Well, it's the same principle here. Yes, it's just like God said, nevertheless, we can't go. Nevertheless, it's too hard. It's too difficult. I want you to remember that, that they were all insisting that it was too hard, that it was too difficult. There's just no way. They got giants over there. You know, that reminds me of another time when Israel had the same problem. And that is when the army of Israel was supposedly doing battle with the Philistine army. You remember how that Jesse, the father of those seven sons, he sent his youngest son, David. He told him, he says, go up to uh, see how your brothers are faring for the army of Israel is doing battle with the Philistines. The only problem with that, there wasn't any battle going on. Not a single, not one single skirmish even. And the reason for that was that everybody in the army of Israel was unwilling to go the Philistine giant. They went out there. They looked at that guy that was almost 10 foot tall. They said, well, there's no, no reason or no way I can defeat him. Remember, the, the challenge of Goliath, of Goliath was you send out one soldier. It wasn't going to be a battle against this army and this army. It was going to be a battle between Goliath and just one who was selected there in the army of Israel. And nobody wanted to go. And not only that, but King Saul, who stood head and shoulders above all the men of Israel himself, was so afraid that he offered one of his daughter as wife to anybody 
that would go out there and fight this giant. And he said, not only that, but if you go out there, fight the giant, and you prevail, then your whole family will be tax-free. And that was a big deal. That was a very big deal. But think about this for just a moment, will you? Saul, because he did not include God in the picture, was willing to send out one man to fight this big giant and the fate of the entire Israeli nation was at stake. Because the deal was whoever wins, the other people become their servants. And Saul was willing to risk being a servant to these Philistines, sending out one other person. But of course, we know the account. David, who God himself described as a man after his heart, he came along. He said, what's going on here anyhow? And, and, and did I hear that uncircumcised Philistine say that he would defy the army of Israel, you know, to come out and fight? And there's nobody willing to go out there? What in the world's going on here? And you know the account how that David went to Saul and said, yeah, I'll go, no problem. And he went. He went out to find him and to fight with him. And David said, you come to me with a sword, a javelin, and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted and insulted. In other words, David said, listen, you're a big old boy, no question about it. You itty bitty fella compared to my God. And he's going to deliver you into my hand this very day. And he did. These people, going back to the people that were supposed to go into the land of Canaan, the ten spies was so convincing that the whole, the whole crowd there, the whole bunch of them, not just Moses and Aaron but, uh, and the other ten men. Uh, uh, but everybody, they were speaking to the whole bunch. And it tells us that they were in agreement with him. And not only were they in agreement with me, uh, uh, you know, he said, Oh, do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. Boy, that's such a rallying cry. Everybody was excited, right? Yeah, they were excited. They were excited about stoning him to death. That all the congregation said to stone them with stones. There's a lot of lessons, just a bunch of different lessons that we could consider this morning from this account. God described Caleb because he had a different spirit and had followed God fully. And this morning I want us to look at the idea that Caleb had a different spirit primarily. And as we begin that, Caleb was rewarded because he had a different spirit and then because he had followed the Lord fully. We'll read there in Numbers chapter 14, verse 30, Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Those, God, God was talking to these people and, and he said, You ain't going to go. None of you except Joshua and Caleb. And remember, he's talking to his people, and he's talking to his people in the day when Moses was leading them, in the day that they came to the south side of the land of Canaan, and, and Moses was the one that sent them in there in the first place, the 12 spies. And so we're talking about back when these people came out of Egypt, they saw all the miracles of God. Moses got to, and the congregation got to the south entrance of the, uh, of the uh, land there that God had given and promised to Abraham. All they had to do was just cross over the river Jordan and they could have the whole thing. And Moses said, there it is. And they wouldn't go. 
they wouldn't go. And the reason why they wouldn't go is because they saw giants, they saw fortified cities, they said that the, that the people over there are really rough, tough kind of people uh, that devour, uh, you know, all the inheritance. And in other words, they were saying, "I don't, <laughs> we just can't, uh, we can't win over there. We're going to lose the whole thing. Have you ever considered and thought about the fact that God promised to be with his people. And he promised this tremendous reward of the land of Canaan. He, he had told Abraham, I want you to just take a look. And he also told Moses the same thing when he was on top of Mount Nebo. He said, just look out there. As far as the eye can see, all of that I'm going to give to you. All of that's going to be your land. I promise you that. Well, Caleb was a guy that received that promise, but he didn't receive it immediately. You know, that's one of the things that we sometimes struggle with, and that is that we're having difficulties, and Vince did a good job of pointing out some of the difficulties that we have from time to time. And sometimes it's just really, really, really hard to even see ourselves making it through, getting through, being victorious over whatever it is that I'm having to deal with. I'm well aware of the fact that there are some of my brothers and sisters that suffer from depression. I've got no clue what that's like. I really don't. You all know I'm, I'm just a happy person by nature. And I don't understand fully about the depression. I do understand that there's such things as clinical depression, that there's a chemical uh, in our brain that uh, we don't either have or is not functioning fully or whatever the case may be. It's not because we are people of little faith or that we're not good people or anything like that. It is a clinical situation and that there are medications that can help but I don't understand what my brothers and sisters who have that particular situation I really don't understand what that's like because I've never experienced anything like that but others do and others have and there are others who have conquered that and everybody can conquer it with God's help and I'm not saying that it's just a snap I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not saying that it's instant he did not get his reward as soon as they crossed over the Jordan because <laughs> he didn't get to immediately cross the Jordan did he he had to wander around in the wilderness 40 years, and not only that, but he had to wander around the wilderness with, for 40 years with them knuckleheads that said, we can't do it. He had to walk for 40 years among a people that did nothing but say discouraging things. He had to walk for 40 years through a wilderness knowing good and well that just over there, we can just cross the river Jordan into the land of Canaan, placing our faith in God, and it will be ours, all ours. And not only that, but God's the one that's going to do the fighting. Now, we just got to go. God will be with us, and he will give us the victory. But he had to walk 40 years. It was 40 years... He was 40 years old when he started. He was 80 years when they finally went into the land. There was another five years that, he, that took place before Caleb was even going to get a possession in the land. He was 85 years old, and I want you to keep that in mind because that's very important. 85 years old when finally he was going to be able to take possession of some of the land in the land of Canaan. Jesus, folks, 
Jesus tells us what's waiting for us. This is not something that we can just kind of vainly hope for. You know, we know that genuine hope is desire plus expectation. That's what hope is all about. We desire for something. We expect for it to take place or to receive it or whatever. That's what genuine hope is. God has given us a genuine hope in Jesus Christ that heaven is waiting for us. That we will stand in the very presence of the God that we are here to do a very best job to worship this morning. We are here to stand before God that if we get to, get to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ and by the grace and mercy and patience of God, we get to go to heaven, we get to stand before the eternal God and we ourselves become eternal as well. And forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and nine billion forevers, and that's not enough, but forever, brethren, we get to stand before God and do something that man on this earth never got to do, and that is look directly at him while we praise him. In his presence, filled with joy, and also be given a glorified body that's exactly like the glorified body of Jesus. And Jesus even promised that you will sit on my throne with me. And I don't understand what that says. I, don't, I really don't. I don't understand what all that means. I just know one thing. That's pretty special. Because Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God on God's throne. God shares his throne with Jesus according to the scriptures. But Jesus said, listen, in eternity, here's the deal. I'm going to be sitting on my throne and you're going to be sitting there too. I can't get, I really can't wrap my mind around that, but I do know that that's a promise of God and that it will take place. Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Oh, my. In other words, when God decides that this is enough, which I don't know how he can keep putting up for this much longer, but when God says this is enough and he destroys all his creation, and we stand before Christ in judgment and we hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. We're standing in the presence of our God. Then we will be there with our Savior. And I want to tell you, I'm glad that in eternity there's no such thing as time. Because I want to spend, if you will, I can't even talk in connection with no time. But I want to spend a lot of what there ain't in heaven <laughs> kissing the feet of Jesus and saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking my sin upon you and judging the, 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 taking the judgment of the Father because of my sins. The last thing I want to say is that Caleb chose the difficult. He went to Joshua and he said, listen, Moses promised me that he'd give me, you know, that I'd have some land. Now then give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for his inheritance. Do you see that, ladies and gentlemen? Do you see that? Caleb said everything that those other ten spies came back from spying out the land said that there's just these giants over there, there's great walled cities, and there's all kinds of bad people over there that we cannot con conquer, so we can't go over there. Caleb is now saying, give me that. Let me have a whack at those people. Give me a chance to call upon my God 
and let me see firsthand what he's going to do. I'm getting chills on my head. This is a great God we're here to worship this morning. And we should be like Caleb as to the very best of our ability. I know it's hard. I know it's hard when, when you have financial troubles like Vince said. I know that it's hard when there are medical issues. I know it's hard as far as family issues. I know that it's hard uh, when all kinds of things in this life happen. I'm not trying to minimize those at all. God was not trying to minimize those things when James wrote, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And I know that we have a hard time understanding what in the world God was talking about when he had James say, Count it all joy when all this kind of stuff comes along. And I don't for a second believe that God said, when you have adversity, when it seems like that perhaps you're, you, you're suffering from depression or, or some other kind of situation to where you don't even feel like getting out of the bed, you don't feel like doing anything, just to think about something, I think it, it gives you a headache. I don't know, but it sounds like it. God is not saying when something like that saying uh, happens, just sit there and laugh. He's not saying that. Never said that. Never intended for anybody to say that. He said, consider it all joy when you encounter, encounter various trials. I come because the testing of your faith produces endurance. And God, through the inspired writer, tells us, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of of endurance so that when you have done the will of God you may receive what was promised why should we count it all joy when we have to face some of the most difficult things that the God ever allows us to have to face in this life because if we will include God in the picture ask him get me through this just get me through this day because by the way folk Today's all we got. Today's all we got. So if you're having a hard time, if you're having a bad day, rejoice in the fact that it's going to come to an end. And don't worry about tomorrow, as Brother Vince pointed out, because it's got enough junk in it already. Let's not pile things up. We should count it all joy because the testing of what we are going through, the testing of our faith, the testing of our ability to rely upon God produces endurance and endurance, never giving up. I don't care if you sin every single day that you're alive on this earth, do not quit. You go to God and ask Him for His grace and mercy and His forgiveness and stand up and start over and keep going because God has promised eternal life to those who don't quit. But he did say in Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. It was a song that was very popular. Well, there's just a few people in the audience that are Mature enough to remember the song that had to do with not quitting. And for the life of me, because I'm one of those people mature enough. <laughs> but it's the idea of just don't give up. Don't give up. The little ant is able to build great things. Why? Because they just keep going and so forth and so on. And brethren, that's what God tells us. He said, I'll give you eternal life. You don't have to be perfect. I want you to be as perfect as possible. Work at it all your life. Never, never stop working at it. But if you won't give up, which is the one thing that Satan is trying to do when he tempts us, brethren, is to get us to give up. He cannot make us give up 
It's a choice, just like Vince talked about. He can't make us give up. And with God's help, we won't give up. And we have heaven waiting for us. Oh, my goodness. What a glorious thought. I'm fighting the tears too, Vince. Praise God, brethren. Praise God that we get to go to heaven and be with him. If you don't enjoy that hope this morning, we pray with all our hearts that you will come and let Jesus wash you and cleanse you of your sins, that you might have this same hope, this glorious, grand, joyous hope that you one day too will be in the presence of God, look upon his glory and be exactly as far as a glorified body like Jesus, the Lord and Savior. With all our heart, we pray and hope that there's someone here this morning that needs to obey the gospel and that you will come. Dale has selected the invitation song, Something for Thee. We pray that each and every one of you who have a need to let God work in your life, save you from your sins, or strengthen you to fight the day, let us know what you need God to do for you. And we'll do the best to help you ourselves. But mainly, we're depending on God too. Do you need to come? If so, do so right now while we stand and sing. Wednesday night for another period of Bible study. 
and we're continuing our theme through the Bible. So next Wednesday, Tom, Sunday evening, or Wednesday evening in the adult class, we'll be talking about the Passover event, which is important, one of the most important events in not only Jewish history, but it's our history as Christians. So be here if you can, uh, Wednesday night at, at uh, 7 o'clock. I uh, wanted to thank uh, Bill, excellent lesson, Vince for his words, Tim uh, for his wonderful job on the Lord's table. Appreciate all these men that put so much effort into um, their talks each and every week. We've really strived this year as men to improve our worship, and I think we've done that. Corinthians, the book of Corinthians, talks about how when they were worshiping, they were doing things out of order. They were doing things unorganized, and Paul had to reprimand them a little bit for that. And so we try and strive here to make sure that our worship service is not only organized and edifying, but according to the Word of God and not having any distractions. So again, thank you, men, for all the effort you put into it. And along those lines, um, once a month we've been doing a men's training class, which is where we work on things to improve not only our worship, but our individual uh, talents. God has told us that if you're not building your talents, then you're wasting them. So I encourage all the men to always come, every man, whether you're going to be leading songs or not, to, to come to our um, song service instruction next Sunday at 4.30 um, to encourage, not, not only be encouraged, but encourage the men that are striving to do better in that, in that area. So please attend that if you can. We'll be having a closing uh, song, Hallelujah, We Shall Rise, and then we will be led in a closing prayer. Men, um, the chorus is a men bass lead, so make sure we're strong on that bass lead, man. I appreciate it. We'll try and keep the tempo down because it gets kind of fast there at the end. I'm trying to find my key, which is some of the things we're going to go over next. <laughs> so if you want to learn about music in general and you don't want to lead, that, I'm going to be going over all that stuff. In the resurrection morning, when the trump of God shall sound, we shall rise.
Our Father in heaven, how do we give thanks to thee and praise thee in just a couple of minutes? I can't. But we're so thankful that we've been able to be here. So thankful for the gifts that you give us. So many gifts. The gift of your son. And what it means to us. We're thankful for love. It is a gift. We're thankful for this church. We're thankful that we can come to thee like this and talk to you and be talked to by you to us through thy word. We're thankful for edification when we come here that we can build one another up. Thankful for each and every soul here this, this morning. Our hope and our prayer, Father, is that we can live our lives in this coming week in a way that's pleasing unto you. And we pray that we can access the greatest gift of all, and that is to be with you and see your face in the after a while. Continue with us now, Father. Help us to do what we need to do. Please forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.